All right, so this is April, our month of joy that we're celebrating here. Uh, I'm Pastor Steve. Welcome with a joyful face, a joy, joyful spirit, and a joyful one on my shoulder here. Um, let's take a moment, greet one another, be super spreaders of joy uh, for a minute. Shake somebody's hand, give them a hug, a, a, a holy fist bump, something like that, uh, and we'll share announcements in just a moment. Nice. Uh, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, it is such a joy and a blessing to be joined together in your presence this morning for the purpose of glorifying your name. Lord, we've already sung one song of praise to you in profession, uh, and Lord, we just pray that as we have done so, as we have sung along or as we have heard that song, uh, that our spirit has already begun to be cleansed from uh, just what we've experienced in the last week. And we pray, Lord, that as we continue to sing songs of praise to you and hear from your word, that you continue to do a work within us, within our lives, uh, changing us and transforming us into your holy image. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Um, you can be seated. Pastor Steve is going to come, and he's going to bring the word to us. But as he comes, um, let's, uh, let's go before the Lord, and, uh, and let's quiet our hearts. Father God, we know that your presence is here. It's in this place. And Lord, every, every time we gather, I, I think about this truth. You are already there. And Lord, sometimes uh, I know I have been guilty of, of being in a place where worship is, is occurring, where prayers are happening, and I've walked away and I've said to myself, where was God? The truth is you, you are there. But sometimes, Lord, we allow ourselves to be so caught up in what we think we want, what we think we need, that we forget to really quiet our hearts and pay attention to what you want us to hear. So, Lord, this morning, I pray that you would help me, help each of us to quiet our hearts and to hear you. Lord, we know you speak to us with a still, small voice. And, Lord, I'm reminded of the scripture that says, Be still and know that I am God, which is literally translated, Quit struggling and know that I am God. So, Lord, help us today to listen to you and to respond to you and to be obedient to your leading. I pray that you would empower Pastor Steve with your Holy Spirit to bring the word in a right way. Lord, help him and help us to receive your word and your truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, boy, what a, what a journey we've been on so far in 2024. On our, on our Sunday mornings, we started out the year looking at uh, Elijah and his challenge to the prophets of Baal. Uh, and the, the fact that he took an important first step in repairing the altar uh, to God. And then during the Lent season, uh, we had taken a look at uh, the, various, the various offerings brought to the altar in the times of the Old Testament and how they relate to our lives today. A Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, I was able to, to share with you about the, uh, the factual record of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And then last Sunday, uh, as we shared in praise and testimony, you all were able to share with one another, we were able to share as, as a church, the testimony, the good news of the risen Jesus working in the lives of one another today here in 2024. And today we take another step as we begin to look at what we believe. And it seems like it ought to be straightforward, right? You know, what do we believe in as, as, as Christians? What do we believe in as the church? But the reality is, and maybe some of you have experienced this uh, in recent days, weeks, months, years, where somebody asks you, hey, what do you believe? And you kind of stumble and stammer for words. 
right? We're not great at putting it into, the word, into words, and as a nation that uh, used to, anyway, be largely identified as a Christian nation, we didn't have to worry about explaining that too much because we understood what one another talked about. And then we would talk about things like, you know, what's the difference between uh, Free Methodist and United Methodist or Baptist and Presbyterian and so on and so forth. Uh, and we would talk about those distinctions instead of what do you believe as a follower of Jesus? But now we find ourselves in a day and a time when uh, those who are becoming adults today, uh, in many instances, in fact, it's near the majority, have no church background whatsoever. They don't know the stories of the Bible. They don't know, uh, they don't know our inside language, our vernacular. And so it makes it much more complex to answer the question, what do you believe? And so we're going to spend some time over the next uh, handful of weeks looking at one of the earliest statements of belief in the history of church, and that's called the Apostles' Creed. And to be sure, this question about what you believe is not a new question. It's a question that has existed across uh, so much of a span of time that these creeds, the Apostles' Creed being the oldest of the creeds in the church, uh, came about quite early. I mean, we know that the Apostles' Creed uh, came about as early as the second century, and quite possibly earlier than that even. Uh, legend has it, we can't prove this, but legend has it, the reason it's called the Apostles' Creed is that there's 12 apostles, there's 12 lines in the creed. Legend has it that each apostle wrote one line of the creed. Okay? Don't state that as fact. It's not. It's, it's a neat aspect or, or a neat part of the perhaps history that we don't know. Uh, so anyway, this, this notion of what we believe has been a problem that spans the centuries. And it's important not only to be able to give an answer or a response when someone asks, hey, you're Christian, right? What do you believe? But it's important also as well to know this and have this firm identity so that the church doesn't drift away from the basic truths, orthodoxy, right thinking, sound doctrine. So that there's no drift, okay? I don't know about you, but you may know of some, some churches or church groups that have drifted in recent years. It's because they don't know what they believe. And boy, we don't want to be one of those. And so we're going to talk today about this word, believe. And then we're going to talk about the first line in the Apostles' Creed. And it's kind of like a, an Oreo uh, sermon structure today. We're going to talk about believe. Then we're going to talk about God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. Then we're going to talk about believe again. So you got good stuff, some really great stuff in the middle, and some more good stuff at the end, okay? Um, so we're going to talk about this idea of believe and what it means because we don't really understand, believe, or operate with the right definition of belief in far too many regards uh, as the church today. So while we're thinking about that, while that's settling in, I want you to stand with me. We're going to read together the key verse, Romans 15, 13, uh, for this series. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the preservation of your word and the gift of your written word that we are able to, to read and study and to uh, preach from and hear from and learn from uh, as we seek to draw closer to you. And Lord, all of us here today are, are probably uh, to some degree 
Like the father of the boy who was so sick, needed healing, needed, needed a touch from Jesus. Uh, if we're being honest, and we'll say, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And so, Lord, in as much as we are honest today, we ask, Father, that through this time together, you will do a work within our very spirit, not just our mind, but do a work within our very spirit that builds our belief. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So we get filled with joy and peace through believing. And then by the partnership, the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit, we could abound in hope. And so this should give us a real clue that, that this belief is, is different than how we often use the word. I mean, most of you know that come fall, I cheer for the right and holy college football team. Right, Mark Mitchell? Go blue. Yeah. Y'all need Jesus. Anyway, I believe in University of Michigan football. It's in my heritage. Uh, my wife was shocked when we first started dating, and she showed up to the first family reunion, and there was a sea of maize and blue lawn chairs and tents and so on and so forth. But in that heritage was alumni and other employees and uh, uh, professors and so on and so forth. So uh, it's in my heritage. So I, I believe in University of Michigan football, and I believe that not only is it the superior college football team in the state, but it's the superior college football team in the Midwest, and it's the superior college football team in the United States of America. I believe that. They proved it this year, right? It's been a long time. But I'll tell you what. I didn't believe it so much that I was like the goofball that got a tattoo at the beginning of the season <laughs> for a different team that didn't win the national championship, right? So I, I believe these things, but it's not a belief that takes action before it happens. And that's where most of our belief is. Many of us wake up on the morning of December 25th and there's a belief in a, in a certain somebody that came to visit the night before. And there's a belief that there's going to be gifts under the tree from that certain somebody. Right? There's a belief there. Um, and that belief, depending on your age and your level of belief, means that you put cookies and milk or something like that out for the, the visitor, the guest. Knowing that they'll be gone and gifts are going to be there in the morning. But at a certain age, that belief goes away, and um, the belief changes to something different. We start to believe in the spirit of generosity represented by that individual, right? And that's where most of our belief is. But this belief written of and spoken of in the Bible is something so much greater. One story that, uh, that, that paints a good picture of this is there was a man, he was out hiking, and uh, he fell off a cliff. I was thinking about demonstrating it. I won't for safety reasons. <laughs> he fell off a cliff, and uh, as he fell, he grabbed onto a limb that was hanging out from the wall of the cliff and was hanging there. And as he was praying, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And the angel of the Lord says to him, you know, you prayed, what's going on? And he says, well, I need, I need saved. I, look, I'm hanging here. I'm going to die if I let go, and I can't hang on forever. And the angel of the Lord says, do you believe in me? And the man says, yeah, I believe in you. And the angel says, good, then let go. All of a sudden, belief becomes different. Will we let go? That's the kind of belief that the Bible talks about. is the belief where we let go, trusting in the goodness of God. 
So when we say things in the church like, I believe in, in this case, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. That means that not only do I agree that God is the Father, the maker, the creator of heaven and earth, but I believe so much that I let go of anything else. And that is my foundational truth, fundamental reality, basis for everything else. So we're going to go this morning now to the uh, the, the God, the Father part, um, and take a look at Psalm chapter 33 for that. I'm throwing Gina a curveball this morning. I'm sure she's excited. We're not going to do the whole Psalm. We're going to do a portion of it and then a scripture that I didn't even tell her about, but that's okay. So in this Psalm, we have a sort of outline here that talks about the very nature of God. And if you were to break it down, you can get about seven characteristics of God out of this. Uh, and we would see in the 33rd Psalm that uh, the general themes, God is faithful. Do you believe God is faithful? I do. I know. God is good. Yes, He is good. God is creator. I believe God is creator. God is sovereign. That means he's got power. He rules over all things. God knows your need. Ooh, might get a little tough there. That's where we've got to let go of that, that branch that we're hanging on to to keep from falling. God saves. And God gives hope. So that's the general theme, the general outline of this 33rd Psalm. Uh, but we're going to look at... Uh, briefly and more specifically, God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth. So uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Follow along on the screen or your Bible or your Bible app, whatever you have in front of you. It's important to do that because I could lie to you from up here, and if you just follow along on the screen, you wouldn't know, right? So uh, Psalm 33, verses 1 through 9. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to Him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all His work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. A brief digression. It's really cool to have a little Jesus up here that I hang on to when I'm reading the Word of God. That just struck me as I was doing that. Um, if you see a little Jesus around the sanctuary, take it home with you. Take it to work. Take it to school. Because as a reminder, Jesus is everywhere. And we all need a little Jesus in our lives I have one on my desk. It makes me smile every time I notice him there. It makes me smile every time to see the one up here as well. Uh, but anyway, back to this psalm. We shout for joy in the Lord. We praise Him. We give thanks to Him. And the psalmist goes right into the fundamental truth of Christianity. This reality of who God is. That God is the Creator. That God is the Father, the Maker of heaven and earth. We know this. We know this to be true. Of Creator God, Maker of heaven and earth. We know this to be true by simple observation. Paul wrote to the church in Rome... And this speaks to the reality of humankind. He wrote to the church in Rome. It's Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 20. 
for His invisible attributes, talking about God, namely His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that, they, that have been made. So they, unbelievers, are without excuse. Have you ever been out in nature? A viewing, viewing something in nature, the earth, or in the heavens, and looked at it and thought, how can anyone deny the existence of God? I mean, we saw that last week, right, with the eclipse. How could anyone deny the existence of God? You've got, you've got a sun that is 400 times larger than the moon and a moon that is 400 times closer than the sun, and this was an accident? I don't think so. So when we are in His creation, we clearly perceive the reality of His attributes, His eternal power and divine nature. We know this to be true right in our very core, whether we know the Word of God or not. We know this to be true, that there is a higher power, a Creator God, and if we choose not to believe, we have no excuse. Because God communicates His existence through His very creation. We know this to be true, God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, because the Bible says so. According to the Bible, God created the universe in two steps. First, He spoke it into existence. We just read that. It's repeated in Hebrews 11. We read it in the creation account in Genesis as well. He spoke it into existence. The second step, on 12 separate occasions, five different human authors of the Old Testament revealed that God stretched out the stars from a small starting point to their present locations. He made the great expanse, drew it out. And what a beautiful image that is. And it's one that science is still trying to catch up with God. At its best and in its purest form, science is observing the universe around us and learning from it what we can. With our limited understanding, we notice some things and we notice a pattern of things and we form ideas based on that and then we create a, a, a theory and then we test that theory over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then in today's world, you'll write a paper on it and all your peers will try to find everything wrong with what you wrote and your testing and so on and so forth. And the process repeats itself several times over. But that is science, trying to take what God has created and put in motion and learning from it what we can. Sir Francis Bacon, a 16th century philosopher and scientist, once stated that a little science estranges a man from God. A lot of science brings him back. A little bit of science, if we have limited scientific knowledge, it could take us away from God and we start to put our trust in science and scientists and deny God. But if we're willing to be honest and look at the whole of science, a lot of science, a great body of work of science, it brings us back to the truth that there can only be a God who is the creator of the universe. And so in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father, creator, maker of heaven and earth. In the Apostles' Creed, it starts with that statement, and it's really brief about God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, because that was pretty much universally believed to be true. 
But now we monkey around with a little bit of science and let, us, let that take us away from God. Instead of looking at the whole, all of it, and bringing us back to Him so that we universally believe that God is the Father, the Maker of heaven and earth. But that's an important, distinctive, the basic, foundational, fundamental belief of the church. Is that God is the Father. He is Almighty. Has relationship with us like a father. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And everything else flows from that. I want to go back to belief. We're on the other side of the Oreo now, for those of you who split your Oreos. We're on the other side of the Oreo now, looking at belief again. Because this belief is belief that changes how we live, not just on Sunday morning. It's not belief that simply means we get up on Sunday morning and go to church. It's belief that changes how we operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Every fourth year, 366 days of the year. You don't get a day off on leap year. And we see in the life of Jesus, recorded in Matthew chapter 14, is where I'm going to share from this encounter with Peter that so perfectly describes belief then and for you and I today. So in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 32, Jesus had just gotten done feeding the 5,000, okay? He had just fed a crowd with only five loaves and two fish, over 5,000 people. And verse 22 starts out with the word immediately. So immediately after feeding them, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. We're talking the Sea of Galilee here. About four or five miles across the sea. Not real far if you're from Michigan. Really far if you're from Nevada. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat, go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Even Jesus took time to be alone with the Father. Whatever office you hold in the church, whatever you do during the week, you have to take time to get away with the Father. So Jesus took time on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he, Jesus, said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So this amazing thing just happened with feeding the crowd with um, the loaves and the fishes. And Jesus sends his disciples away immediately. Get in the boat and go. Now these are fishermen. These are not people who are nervous about getting in a boat. Mostly fishermen. Their anxiety would not have been high. 
If they had a concern at all, it would have been, well, what about you, Jesus? And then, you know, what are we going to miss out on? But nonetheless, they get out on a boat and go, and this storm kicks up. And the Scripture points out that the storm battered the boat, and they were afraid. And then here comes this figure on the water they thought was a ghost. And Peter calls out, If it's you, Jesus, tell me to come to you and I will. I almost picture him setting up on the, the edge, the side rail of the boat as he's, as he's yelling out to Jesus. And Jesus says, Come. And he hops out into the water and starts to go and then notices the waves all around him because I don't think they could see wind any more than we could. We just see the signs of it, right? Some of you have the signs of the wind to pick up today or tomorrow in your yard. And Peter sees this and loses faith and starts to sink and has to cry out to Jesus to save him. (coughs) But Peter, upon seeing Jesus walking on the water and hearing Jesus say, come, Peter was in a place of belief. He let go of the branch. I mean, he let go of the boat and took off walking on the water. Peter had a special moment with Jesus that no one else will ever have. Because Peter could honestly, truthfully say, I believe. And it's easy to look at this and say, well, Peter failed in his belief because he lost his faith and started to sink, right? And perhaps he did. But I'll tell you what, he didn't fail in his belief any more than the 11 who were in the boat still. See, they never really believed that that was Jesus coming across the water. They were waiting to see still. And so the same is for you and I today. There are things in this life that we hang on to. There are things that we use as our boat that we cling to. It might be the thing that you're afraid of. I would say it's the thing that you're afraid to to let loose of that is your boat. As you navigate the stormy seas of this life. And the seas of this life batter that boat, right? I mean, you live. You know this to be true. They batter that boat. And Jesus is out there. He says, come. And what will we do? What do we do with that? Are we like the 11 that say, I'm going to stay in the security, security of this tattered boat that the storm is pounding away at and tearing apart? Am I going to stay and what I think is the security of the situation or circumstance or, or whatever that I'm clinging to, that life is hammering away at, am I going to stay there to try to be saved? Or am I going to step out of the boat and be with the Savior? I think the big part of it is, is we're afraid that we're going to be like Peter, Right? We're, we're afraid that we'll take that first step or that second step and then a big wave's going to come along and dunk us under the water. It will. But the same Jesus that walks on the water that calls you away from that thing is right there to reach in, pull you back up. I got a picture on my office wall. If I were a smart guy, I would have brought it up here for you to see. I'm not that smart. But it's a picture of Jesus reaching down into the water to grab the hand of Peter, to grab my hand when the water takes me under and pull me back through.
When we step away from the boat and step toward the Savior, there are things that are going to come along and take us under for sure, but Jesus is there to pull you back through. It's also the importance of church, what you're a part of, what you're doing today, is one of the ways that Jesus pulls you back through is through his, his body, his presence on this earth right now, his future bride, the church, so that one another, through our encouragement, through our help, through our faithful service, without even knowing, Jesus will use an encouraging word or an action or something from someone else in the church to pull us back through the water that we may walk towards him and walk with him in the storms of this life. So where's your belief today? I know amongst us, and I'm not even sure myself, but I know amongst us that there's some hanging on to that limb. And the angel's saying, if you believe, you got to let go. I know amongst us there's many that are sitting in that boat that's getting beat up and tattered. You might be floating on a piece of driftwood right now. And for some reason, by your actions... Your hope is in that tattered boat and not the one who come to save you from it all. So what do you believe? Do you believe today? You have to let go of the limb. The old saying, if you want to walk on water, then you got to get out of that boat, right? Right? So we sang a song for Prelude. It's a new song for our church congregation. Uh, the praise team is going to come up and, and play it again. It's called We Believe, and it takes us through some aspects of, of the Apostles' Creed that we'll be talking about over the next several weeks. But as you listen to the song, as you sing this song, as you worship to this song, I want you to consider that word, believe. Do I really believe? Have I let go of the branch really? Am I on the water or am I in the boat? And maybe you're sitting there going, now, Pastor Steve, I'm in the water today. I'll tell you what, if you're on the water, excuse me, if you're in the boat or in the water, if you're hanging on to that branch, let go. Come on up here and pray. We want to pray with you. We want to be the church with you. We want to be a part of of Jesus reaching down and pulling you back up onto the surface of the water, setting you on your feet with a smile and a hug, and saying, I got this. He's got this. Let's sing, and we'll pray.